You've no doubt heard someone out there in the game industry say, pirates are ruining games. In all honesty, this is a philosophical viewpoint. Certainly, it's understandable why somebody selling a game would not like pirates, but implementing things like DRM pisses people off. On top of that, it also makes it more difficult to develop a game. So what can a developer or publisher do? Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, we ask the question, what tricks do developers use to identify pirates? Now, the most obvious way game devs attempt to stem piracy is DRM. But the thing about that is nobody likes DRM. Gamers don't like DRM for the same reason developers don't like DRM. DRM takes resources to run. DRM essentially has to do the same thing a cheat engine might do, which is monitor the RAM. DRM that uses a connection to verify various pieces of code is sending things that it reads out of the RAM or out of the code of the game itself to a server which is verifying it, sending it back and saying, all right, good. Now that's a simplified version of it. De Nuvo specifically, one of the more prominent DRM software packages, uses a 64-bit encryption machine that requires cryptographic keys, basically a cipher that makes the encryption readable, that are supposedly unique to the specific hardware of the system it's running on. Another reason why people don't like Denuvo is because they, well, like their solid state drives, and it seemed as if Denuvo was writing an excessive amount of data to the drive. Now, Denuvo claims that this is not true. Now, this is information that is constantly being disputed. It's an ongoing argument, and I don't want to say that I believe one way or the other because, honestly, things in this kind of argument change quickly. I'm just going to say that I don't like Denuvo or really any DRM. It ends up taking up system resources and causes a game to work less well. Back when the release of Shadow Warrior 2 was looming, the lead programmer of the Flying Wild Hog team had this to say about DRM. We don't support piracy, but currently there isn't a good way to stop it without hurting our customers. De Nuvo means we would have to spend money for making a worse version of our game for our legitimate customers. Which is the absolute truth. When you include DRM, pirates still work to crack it, and they pretty much always do. It's really just a matter of time. So given that the people who actually pay money for a product get an inferior product to the pirates, and given that there is a certain resource budget any game is given and they attempt to stay within those confines, adding DRM reduces the amount of resources available to the game specifically. It's not really the solution people pursue, or should pursue at least. Through the years, developers have done more interesting things to attempt to stem piracy, and some of these come off a lot more effective to me than even just DRM. Going back to Earthbound on the Super Nintendo, they had a very interesting copy protection method. In fact, it was several layers of various methods, some very conventional and some less, that when they worked together basically made the game unplayable, or at very least unbeatable, and I'll tell you how. The first thing Earthbound does is check to make sure you're on an NTSC system, one typically sold in North America or Japan, as opposed to a PAL system, which is typically sold in Europe. If you had a copy of the game that you were trying to play on the wrong system, it seemed obvious that you didn't get it from an official source and therefore were pirating. This is actually why most games are region locked. It's essentially an easily predictable layer of control. But that doesn't necessarily stop you from using a fake version of a game. People would still copy cartridges in North America and Japan, and just the region obviously wouldn't stop them from playing a pirated game. So if somebody had a pirated cart of the game, that is a cartridge, the cartridges typically had more than eight kilobytes of SRAM, which is the type of memory that they typically saved games to. This was done by pirates to avoid manufacturing lots of different sizes of cartridge. And if the game noticed that there happened to be more than eight kilobytes of SRAM, it would just flash a warning message and say, hey, <laughs> no. Of course, you could modify the code to skip this check, which a lot of pirates did, but Earthbound included another thing. It checked to see if that check was skipped, and if the check was skipped, it begins to throw a ridiculous number of enemies at the player. And while I'm sure that Soulsbound is probably appealing to some people, just a ridiculous impossible version of Earthbound, to a lot of people, that just made the game unplayable. In fact, in a lot of areas of the game, you could easily not even notice there are enemies, and yet suddenly it's just covered in them. Finally, let's say you are the hardcore gamer that's like, fine, I like more enemies, bring on the fight. 
Well, they make it so you actually can't beat the final boss. In fact, it freezes in the middle of the battle, then deletes all your save games, then resets the game. The original Spyro Year of the Dragon for the PlayStation did a lot of similar things. The developers of Game Dev Tycoon, Greenheart Games, actually put out the pirated version of their software on their own. When their game came out, they put up a torrent of the quote-unquote full version of Game Dev Tycoon for Windows, cracked and working. Now the game itself is almost identical to the actual full version of the game. They just changed some things so that people who pirated the game would have a different experience. There are no enemies in the game though, so you can't just fill up the game with enemies. And just saying, hey, you're playing a pirated version of this game, stop, doesn't really do a lot to teach. Instead, Green Dev Games made it so that as you created your game development company and progressed in the world of game dev, people would begin to pirate your games at an inordinate amount. Basically, it would sink your company no matter what, whether immediately or over time. When people went up on message boards and Steam saying, hey, every single time I try to play this game, people start pirating the game. It was basically them saying, hey, here's evidence that I pirated the game because this happens in the pirated version of the game. And I don't realize that. I don't realize that the game devs themselves put out this very slightly altered version of the game for free for all to download. And as far as I can see, this is basically just a clever little prank. A prank that makes the person have to think about what piracy does. And it doesn't nudge them to purchase the game. It doesn't tell them that they're doing anything wrong. It just shows them that this is what happens when piracy happens. Certainly EA isn't in any danger of going under because of pirates, but game developers the size of Greenheart Games certainly are. Now these are much more creative and in some cases hilarious ways. Hey, enjoy a much harder version of the game. Hey, enjoy what happens when your simulated game developer sinks because of pirates. Isn't that ironic? But something I think you really could do that would reduce the amount of piracy by quite a bit is just making a public demo available, allowing people to actually try the game before buying it. We've been seeing more betas and demos recently than we have in previous years, but it certainly doesn't compare to way back in the day when shareware versions of basically everything was like the first third of a game just out there for you to get. And if you liked it, you could continue playing. This not only provided more incentive to players who wanted to complete the game to buy it, but it also added more incentive for developers to make everything after the shareware section of the game also worth playing. A lot of the time people pirate games because they don't want to spend $60 on something they just don't know if they're gonna want. Having a demo available means there's an end of the experience while giving enough of a taste of it that they might actually want to continue and purchase the game. Whereas if there is no demo available, somebody might download the full game to try it out, get addicted to it, and beat it before buying it and go, oh, well I guess I don't need to buy it. Now that's obviously a very specific kind of pirate. Some pirates will just never pay for a game no matter what, but it generally seems like the more a company does to improve the customer's experience, the less likely piracy is. CD Projekt Red, for instance, didn't include any DRM in The Witcher, and the company has several notable people within it that are very vocally against DRM, and it resulted in a lot of sales of their game because guess what? The game is great. In fact, to go back to the Shadow Warrior 2 devs, Flying Wild Hog, one of their PR people, Archer Maxara, had the following to say when asked what anti-piracy technology they would be interested in. Maxara said, well, the world isn't perfect, so hard to tell. In our opinion, in a perfect world, people would not pirate games and would pay the devs for their work. But in our imperfect world, the best anti-pirate protection is when the games are good, highly polished, easily accessible, and inexpensive. And he's 100% right. The more game seems like a useless cash grab, the more people don't really care if cash gets into the hands of the developers. In fact, a 2013 study that the European Commission ordered that they initially withheld due to the result not being favorable to business concluded that there was absolutely no evidence that when left alone, piracy affects copyrighted sales in any significantly measurable manner. In fact, according to the data, supporting piracy might actually help video game sales. It seems so obvious that the behavior of the customer, including whether or not a customer chooses to be a customer, is influenced by the behavior of the business. 
That seems like it should be obvious, but it took a $430,000 study that was initially withheld. So game developers, publishers, put out quality games. The most creative way a game developer can stem piracy is by being a creative game developer. I realize that sounds really dumb, but if you don't believe me, Google estimating displacement rates of copyrighted content in the EU, the study released by the European Commission. I promise it is significantly more boring than listening to me talk, but if you're interested, you're interested. Ultimately, they have tried a lot of different creative methods through the years, and you do have to appreciate that they are trying to get paid for their labor. It isn't as fun as you might think to create a video game. It's ultimately a lot of work for the enjoyment of others. So it's very easy to understand exactly why they try to do this. And honestly, it's interesting to have a look at a few different ways that they've done it through the years. What do you think of game piracy? Don't say anything incriminating, but put whatever it is you're gonna say in the comment section. And if you like this video, click the button. If you're not subscribed now, it'd be a great time to do so. We are building a Game Ranks army. You can be a part of it by subscribing. You'll see the videos before anyone else, and that is great. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon, you can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.